In this talk, I'll be covering about uh, cloud native integration for the enterprise. So uh, you have heard of a lot of things related to the integration in the morning. So I'll go into the details of some of the patterns and some of the practices and some of the offerings that WSO2 has in this space. So before talking about cloud native integration, let's try to understand what cloud native is, because we have been using that word a lot. Right, so what's your thoughts? What, what is cloud native? Anybody? <laughs> so it's something to do with the cloud, right? So, so if, you look at, uh, at a, if you look for a definition, you'll find uh, Let me check my clicker. OK, yeah. So if you look for a definition of cloud native or cloud native applications, you will find it's a new methodology for building applications, right? And leveraging all the power of cloud computing and all that. So it's a very abstract definition. But the reality with cloud uh, native application is uh, when you are developing a software application, you develop it as a uh, if you are developing it as a cloud native application, the first thing that you would do is you will uh, model it as a, uh, a combination of microservices or cloud native functions. Right? So what you would do is you will identify a particular business domain, uh, the business problem, then you model the cloud native application uh, along those uh, uh, requirements and then uh, you design set of business capability oriented services or functions uh, as the first step. So once you do that, you can package them into containers. That's where you use Docker, and uh, then you want if you, when you have to manage them, you'll use uh, Kubernetes as the orchestration platform. So then you'll run a continuous delivery model, CI/CD uh, model, on top of the, uh, those applications, and finally you deploy that into production and manage. Uh, the entire application in the cloud. So that's where you get all the auto scaling, uh, high availability, observability as part of the uh, cloud offering. So uh, when you are designing a cloud native application, uh, it should actually satisfy all these aspects. So uh, now if you have a closer look at any cloud native application, it comprises of multiple uh, uh, small applications, so fine-grained services, right? But when you're carrying a particular business use case, you need to have uh, interconnectivity or integration between all the uh, small fine-grained applications that you develop. And if you're coming from application integration background, actually application integration is not a new thing, right? It has been there for last several decades. Uh, now, with the cloud-native application, it is still uh, a major challenge. Now, we used to do application integration using a central integration layer, such as ESP, right? Yeah. So uh, we used to have set of services, data, and systems, and ESP connects everything. And you, uh, as programmers or developers, you'll either program at this level or at ESP level, where you create compositions. Later, we had uh, uh, ESP is complex, in order, uh, owing to the complexity of the ESP layer, we had to put an API management layer on top of that as a facade, where you basically simplify all the business capabilities created uh, at the ESP layer and expose them as simplified APIs uh, and managed APIs using the API management layer. So this is the uh, typical uh, architecture that is followed by most of the ex existing enterprises who have not moved into microservices. Now, as you know, with microservices, uh, it fosters the elimination of central uh, components, at least central ESB or central integration. So now what we will have is uh, we have a set of services, right? So all these services are business capability oriented, uh, built around a particular use, uh, business use case. And uh, in order to cater some of the business capabilities, you may have to reuse existing services, right? So existing fine-grained services. At the same time, uh, unless you are a greenfield startup, you will have to live with all the proprietary and legacy systems, as well as cloud APIs or web, uh, SaaS applications such as Salesforce. So you need to have integration of all these components, and microservices uh, also use all these different uh, external APIs to uh, build their business capabilities. 
And when it uh, comes to the communication between all these components, all, all these services, they will either use uh, synchronous messaging, request, re request response style communication, or they'll be, be, they'll be based on an event-driven, uh, like event broker-based communication. And similarly, you'll have the API management layer on top of this. Right? Now, here we don't have any central ESB in this architecture, but uh, where is integration? So actually, integration is everywhere. Right? All these services have some kind of integration capability baked into services. OK, so then you may be wondering, are we heading towards P2P integration again? Because, because ESB is a solution created for uh, avoiding this central, uh, the central, the point-to-point -point integration between components and applications, right? So we are not trying to bring in point-to-point -point integration again, but uh, we have a set of challenges, right? So when you are building any microservices uh, related use case, the inter-service communication between microservices cannot be avoided. It is a must. You need to have inter-service communication. And most of the capabilities that are offered from solutions such as ESBs now has to be implemented as part of the uh, services business logic, right? So all the protocol related uh, stuff, all the resiliency related uh, capabilities are now part of your uh, services uh, business logic. So integration complexity is not uh, reduced actually, it's dispersed across all the services that you develop. And uh, unlike, unlike monolithic architecture, you have more services now. So uh, Paul was talking about like uh, thousands of microservices in Uber's use case. So when you are integrating all these services, uh, the problem is, be is becoming even more hard. Now, if you have heard of service mesh, so uh, there are a lot of misconceptions around service mesh and integration. So service mesh is actually created to overcome some of the limitations that we have in uh, uh, some of the challenges that we have in this uh, decentralized architecture. So if you look at the purpose of uh, building a service mesh, mesh it's an uh, inter-service communication infrastructure. So when a particular service has to call the other service, you need to have uh, different uh, mechanisms such as resiliency, uh, circuit breaking, time timeouts, and uh, secured communication between the two. So all the uh, logic related to uh, related to the business logic actually resides at the service, while you offload the rest to the uh, service mesh sidecar. And it's very important to uh, understand that service mesh is not a distributed ESB. So you are not uh, putting any business logic related uh, integration stuff uh, into the sidecar. So now if you look at a particular comp uh, service that talks to two different other services, uh, the business logic, the service uh, services composition logic actually reside as part of your services code, uh, whereas all the network communication and resiliency related stuff are uh, implemented at the sidecar. Right? So it's an uh, important thing to keep in mind when uh, understanding uh, cloud native integration. Now, uh, if we try to apply uh, the cloud native integration uh, concept into practice, uh, so this is sort of an extended version of the previous diagram. Uh, so we have uh, different types of services, and uh, the important thing is you can select different technologies to build these services. So. Uh, as, as the fundamentals of the microservices architecture, it uh, fosters a polyglot architecture, right? You can use different, different programming languages and frameworks. And when, uh, when you are building these services, for example, these orange colored services, uh, those are like integration heavy services, right? They are talking to multiple other endpoints. So uh, you, can, you have to select the best technology or the framework to build uh, these kind of services. And on top of that, also you have the API gateway, uh, which is managed by a central API management layer. And all this, uh, you can either build this as a central layer or, mon or purely a micro gateway based uh, uh, micro layer, where you can independently scale your uh, API traffic. So let's see some of the, uh, now uh, let's look at some of the main capabilities that you will require when building. So for example, when you are building uh, these services. 
this uh, orange colored services, there are certain set of requirements that you need to have, right? So the first thing is uh, when you are building uh, that kind of composite uh, or integration microservices, you need to have uh, the underlying framework or the language needs to provide all the abstractions because you will be doing a lot of network communication, right? So suppose you are building a, a microservice using C++, C++ and you have to write all the network communication logic as part of your services business logic. So it's, a, uh, it's really complex, right? Uh, so all the abstractions must be provided from the underlying framework. It can be a language or it can be a framework. Uh, and also native support for all the different protocols, uh, HTTP, gRPC, GraphQL, uh, and also different messaging standards, Kafka nets, et cetera. And also, it's good to have uh, connectors for well-known uh, business APIs, right? So for example, uh, rather writing a Salesforce connector from scratch, you need to have some kind of abstraction uh, uh, built for connecting to Salesforce, SAP, and so on. So the next thing is uh, supporting different service composition patterns. So as we discussed in the previous uh, diagram, so there are multiple service uh, composition patterns that you would use. So you can either use uh, uh, active compositions, which is the uh, uh, sort of orchestration between multiple services uh, in a synchronous way, or you can use reactive microservices where, uh, where you model your microservices so that uh, based on a particular event or a stream, uh, you can uh, execute the business logic. So, you will mainly use orchestration-based or choreography-based uh, composition, along with uh, some other related patterns such as event source sourcing or CQRS. <coughs> okay, so the other thing is Kubernetes native. So as you know, uh, most of the microservices development now runs on top of Kubernetes and it has become the de facto standard for running all the containerized applica applications. So uh, one important aspect of, uh, now if you look at any software application, most of the uh, popular applications, they run uh, on Kubernetes, right? Without any issues, you can install that application on Kubernetes. But uh, uh, cloud native doesn't mean that uh, you can uh, run application on Kubernetes and be done with it. But uh, if you are saying your application is Kubernetes native, what it really means is uh, you need to provide some abstractions, some application specific abstractions on top of Kubernetes so that your application can be managed uh, in Kubernetes without going into the uh, details of Kubernetes abstractions. Right? So for example, let's say you are running Kafka on Kubernetes. So in that case, you won't be directly dealing with pods or services. Rather, Kafka will have an operator which will manage all the statefulness of the application. So as a developer or a DevOps uh, person, you will only be using that uh, business abstraction provided from the Kafka operator. So you won't be touching any ports or any Kubernetes specific details. So uh, that's why, so when, when you are building, uh, when you are using an integration or a, uh, a cloud native integration technology, it is good to have uh, this kind of a, a Kubernetes native support. And if you are from an integration background, I'm sure you are familiar with all these enterprise integration patterns. So having support for most of these, uh, the commonly used integration patterns as part of the language is also uh, quite critical. So for example, you can do fork, and fork join, splitting, looping, <coughs> aggregation. So these are very common use cases when you have uh, different microservices interaction. And uh, so we talk about uh, some of the capabilities that you can offload from your services logic as part of the service mesh. But uh, the reality is if you look at the adoption and the usage of service mesh, I'm not sure any of you, you are here are using service mesh in production, right? So that's a reality with uh, most of the other communities as well. Service mesh is a, is a popular thing, but uh, yet to be fully adopted. So therefore, uh, Things such as resiliency, circuit breaking, retrying, uh, bulk heads, all those things has to be implemented as part of the applications that you develop. Right? So therefore, it's, uh, it's good to have these capabilities built into the underlying framework. So uh, again, if you're from an integration background, you are aware of all these message delivery semantics. 
right? So most of the microservices folks are not really talking about these things, but the, the reality is uh, the, the known hard problems in distributed computing, right? Exactly once delivery, at least once delivery. So all these are like hard problems. Still, you need to do, even if you are using cloud native architecture, you have to do that. So again, having this kind of out of the box support for these patterns, such as to and forward, uh, persistent delivery, idempotent important messaging. So uh, this is absolutely critical when you are building this kind of a uh, integration architecture. So then uh, we talked about uh, type and uh, type conversions in the morning as well. But when you are dealing with a lot of other, uh, when you are depending on a lot of other microservices, you have to deal with uh, different data representations, right? Different uh, representations of uh, different types. So either you'll use different uh, type definition mechanisms, such as protocol buffers, uh, JSON schema, XML schema, or even Avro. So you need to have some kind of a consistency uh, and you need to have some kind of a mapping between all the different types that you would be using from different services. So uh, you, you could be using a particular uh, Avro-based uh, contract from a particular service, and then you have to build the code based on that schema. And then uh, when you're converting that to a, pati a particular outbound format, then you have to do uh, some mapping. So uh, you can either do the mapping uh, graphically or programmatically because certain frameworks allow uh, you to do this uh, data mapping bit using a graphical approach and especially if the mapping is very complex and you need to exp uh, and you need to make sure it's uh, easily readable so graphical mapping might be very helpful but uh, programmatical uh, mapping is more powerful in the sense uh, you you have more flexibility right you are using a program you can do whatever the things that you want to do with mapping. So for example, when you are mapping per one particular item to the other side, you can do a lot of operations in between, like converting, uh, appending, and uh, likewise, it's quite easier to do programmatically. So uh, event-oriented or event-driven architecture and streams is on the rise. So I'm not sure how many of you were here in uh, last week Kafka Summit. So they were actually re uh, promoting Kafka as a streaming database. So during last week, so it's it's uh, uh, Kafka and all the streaming platforms are becoming really popular, mainly due to the uh, high adaptation of streaming and event-driven architecture. So if you look at this particular use case, this is entirely built around uh, the concept of uh, events and streams, and only a portion of that is synchronous, right? So uh, therefore, event-driven architecture is becoming very important. So as part of this, you need to support, this is not just uh, PubSub or uh, uh, queue-based messaging, but you need to have, obviously you need to have event-driven messaging capability as part of the technology that you use. But at the same time, you need to have streaming uh, capabilities, such as streaming SQL, uh, as well as uh, uh, the ability to uh, process things such as ETL, CDC, uh, change data capture. All those things are now implemented as uh, 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 implemented using streaming platforms. Finally, uh, there are few or uh, certain set of use cases uh, that uses uh, workflows. Right. So you have uh, uh, long-running stateful processes that you have to implement as part of the microservices that you develop. So the <clears throat> Most of the existing workflow solutions are centralized, not designed for microservices. But uh, with the uh, adaptation of new patterns such as Saga, where you uh, define set of uh, workflow transactions uh, based on the compensation model, and it uses a central uh, distributed log kind of a persistence store so that you can uh, replay and uh, revert all the different uh, distributed transactions using uh, Saga pattern. So there are few workflow solutions that are supporting uh, these patterns at the moment. <coughs> okay, finally, how WS2 will help in achieving uh, most of the challenges that we discuss. So as part of uh, WS2 platform, we are releasing WS2 Enterprise Integrator 7.0. 
so uh, uh, if you are new to WSO2, we have been in the integration business for more than a decade. So we have a very established API management and uh, integration and IAM solutions. So we have uh, faced most of the integration challenges related to the monolithic world. Now then, with the advent of microservices and cloud native architecture, we start seeing uh, how to uh, basically revamp our products or reinvent our products so that they match these uh, cloud native integration needs. So basically, uh, as part of the uh, WS3 EI 7.0, uh, we, we are providing a cloud native uh, API-centric integration platform where it supports basically breaking the entire central monolith into independent integrations. So these are the integration components that you can use from WSO2. And on top of that, API manager, WSO2 API manager can be used as the API layer uh, before exposing those functionalities to the external parties. And the platform seamlessly works with uh, different uh, cross-cutting uh, concern, concerns, such as observability, uh, native support for Kubernetes, and security. So let's look at uh, the formation of uh, WSO2 Enterprise Integrator. So as part of the uh, EI 7.0 release, we are providing Ballerina uh, Integrator, which is the commercially supported version of Ballerina. So this is, a, this is the very first release that we have included Ballerina as a commercial supported offering uh, from WSO2. And uh, we already had an integrator uh, or ESP-based uh, solution built for configuration-driven or graphical data flow-driven integration. So we have actually uh, revamped that integrator as a cloud-native uh, Kubernetes-ready integrator. And for streaming use cases, we have a streaming integrator based on the uh, Siddhi streaming language. Now, this is a... Uh, 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 this is a quick overview of Ballerina Integrator. I'm not going into the details of Ballerina, but uh, on top of Ballerina, what we are providing is all the different uh, patterns, uh, integration patterns, integration templates to integrate with different vendors such as Salesforce, SAP, and so on. So you, uh, from the development uh, tool, you can simply select whatever the templates that uh, you can use and simply integrate. Uh, so it will generate all the required skeleton of the Ballerina code. And as you have seen in the previous talk, uh, you can also visualize all the interactions in the sequence diagram. And for low code or configuration driven, so this is our existing offering. So most of our existing customers are using this, but now they can use uh, this without any modification, they can use this solution on Kubernetes. So we have a built-in Kubernetes operator and uh, all the uh, uh, development is based on the graphical data flow, flow modeling uh, based on this visual tool. And uh, most of the capabilities of previous integrator is also included, uh, uh, apart from some of the management capabilities that are not very commonly used. So the Siddhi integrator, it's a, uh, uh, it's a streaming la query language. So it's a DSL based on uh, DSL that we have designed. So based on that DSL, you can uh, create, uh, you can basically start listening for the queries coming in from different sources. So it can be Kafka, Nets, so any similar source. Then you create the streaming uh, query language, uh, streaming query to process the incoming stream. And again, you can uh, emit that uh, uh, stream to a particular, any, any given uh, API, or it can also talk to micro integrator so that it seamlessly connects with the uh, other uh, ecosystem. So basically, you'll do the streaming at the streaming integrator, and all the integration capabilities can be implemented at the uh, uh, micro integrator layer. So uh, feel free to download DI7 and give it a try. So there are a lot of other use cases related to microservices as, uh, that we have provided as part of the documentation. So finally, uh, so if you look at application integration, it's almost everywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter you are using microservices or monolithic ar architecture, you have to live with application integration. And service mesh is not for application integration. It's just an infrastructure thing, and it's even more becoming infrastructure component because most of the cloud offerings are actually providing service mesh as a service. And finally, uh, it's, it's very important to select the best technology uh, 
you have to evaluate all the available technologies and select the technology to build this kind of integration services. When you are building composite services, uh, uh, you cannot really stick to conventional languages such as Java or C++ or, uh, or similar alternatives. So you need to properly evaluate and select the best of breed uh, framework. All right, thank you.